They speak right and good. Mm -hmm. Member of the March, the member of the third friend. You heard him? Yeah, no. Got to get it up here, Bob. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, let's start over. Um, I'm Dale Keith, a member of the Farm Committee. <clears throat> well, tomorrow marks the annual commemoration of the Indigenous People's Day. As part of that commission, commemoration, I'm honored to. to to introduce Dr. Mark Freeman, who just arrived here in Milwaukee this year from South Dakota State University. Mark is a member of the Bear Clan and the Ball of the Community in Northern Michigan for the Sault Ste. Marie Jubilee. His research focuses on how the indigenous work worldview is an important component of cultural and religious and linguistic translations. At UWM, Professor Freeman will be serving as an associate professor of anthropology and a director of the Electroclinic Institute. I'd like to read the land acknowledgement that is part of the Electroclinic Institute's mission statement page on its website. We acknowledge in Milwaukee that we are on traditional Potawatomi Pochunk and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of Michigan County, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes. The Milwaukee, Menominee, and the Connecticut rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign, the Michigan Pochunk, Menominee, and the Atlanta, and the Mohican traditions remain. Let's welcome Professor Fiona. We're just going to wait a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, I got a little bit of ring there. Oh, be careful. Buck, when you go down, uh, Bobby Ting and Dr. Bob, Mark Freeman and Deshnikas. Uh, so, there is my claim. And I am from the Buckwood Ting and Nishinaabe Nation, uh, what is now Northern Michigan. And um, Mark is how I'm called. So it's always fun to see um, like Google Translate. That's okay. I will try to explain it as best I can. It's fun with technology, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so uh, I, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to see everybody here this morning. And uh, so today I will. Um, go into a few items and talk about some of my research regarding worldview and the ways in which it is related to land specifically, and to discuss the role of decolonization. Um, and to do that, we'll do some define, defining terms around colonization, settler colonialism, and decolonization to kind of get a deeper understanding. Uh, and what I want to couch this in, um, we think about as decolonial thinking is kind of a title here, and worldview is a method for understanding being what king. So you know what king is a uh, good land, right? And I'm sure a lot of you have heard that term. That's where Milwaukee comes from, right? It's, it's kind of a, a weird anglicization of our, our own language, right? So you know what king is a good land. Um, and so how, how do we come to name a place like that? And as we know, places aren't named for a conspicuous absence of something, right? So well, what was the good land? How do we conceptualize those things? Why? Why is that the name, right? So Babuting is my home community. Um, Babuting in my language means uh, Babutigo is uh, the rapids, and Babuting, when you put ing and ong at the end of it, like you know what king, uh, it makes it a located, right? So it's a place. Uh, it makes it specifically uh, a specific location, right? Um, so a place of the rapids in Babuting. And so that is the east side of Lake uh, uh Lake Superior now, and that is where the large rapids that goes flows out of that area, so it makes perfect sense, right? Or Mackinac uh, where my great grandmother was originally from, uh, the place of the turtle. There's more islands there that resemble turtles. There's a strong turtle clan um, leadership role from that community, right? So we have these particular places 
these locations that have particular names that are important, right? How did Ho Chunk, Madamini, and Panamaki folks get along? Right? I hope that's a bit of a head scratcher to you, right? That we that we're using very different understandings of culture, nationalism, and, and boundaries or lack thereof boundaries between peoples. Right? We're talking about Ho Chunk as a Sumi language group, right? It's a very different language group. Whereas Menominee and Pamir both Algonquin, right? So there's a strong correlation. Um, people who are adept at speaking in Shnabigoin uh, or Jibigoin can understand Menominee pretty well and vice versa. Uh, so there are some interesting components here that we can get into to think through, but to get at that, we have to get a much deeper understanding of how worldview functions. And my work kind of gets into those um, definitional particulars, right? So I'm going to get nerdy here for a few minutes, right? So I'm looking at, I'm going to presume that there's some nerdy folks along with me. We can go ahead and just kind of dig in. Um, a little bit about my own background. I, uh, I grew up in, in, uh, in Michigan, uh, actually down the state. I grew up in my home community, but that's the political center is Bellevue, where I'm enrolled. Um, the town that I grew up in is called Chiasening, uh, and now called Chesening. Um, so Chi, Big, uh, Asing, uh, which is the rock and the place located in, so the place of a big rock. Um, and that was a, a, an Ojibwe village for a very, very long time, uh, prior to people being moved out of there in 1855. Mm -hmm. um, I spent 15 years in Denver uh, at the Ellis School of Theology. I'm theologically trained. Uh, my PhD is in religious and theological studies. Um, I do also hold a Master of Divinity degree, so I have the same <laughs> Master degree that most pastors do. Um, so that is kind of my own take in kind of coming to some of this information, which leads me down to a deeper understanding of cultural theory. Uh, and that is some particularly important things. There's an insert your own joke in here around like going the long route about to figure out that I'm not Christian. You know, this whole <laughs> theological school. Um, but there are some really important ways of making these distinctions and why worldview is really important. So if we're going to get into some of those pieces, um, when we think about the colonization, so this is a, a pretty big term, right? So we have two basic differences, two types of colonization we should pay attention to, classic colonialism and southern state colonialism. So classic colonialism. Can we get anything? Classical colonialism and settler state colonialism. Yes. So, I, unfortunately, my, my PowerPoint didn't quite get into this whole setup there. I'm a little behind the curve. So, I thought that I'd have to deal with my auditory negotiation. Um, so, with classical colonization, we want to think about like a host European country goes to somewhere, sets up an, an indigenous elite to um, impose a system of power in which resources can be extracted. Think Africa, think Southeast Asia, right? Where Britain and among other European powers go in and set this up, but use the local indigenous population as labor to extract resources, right? That is different from settler state colonialism. Here we're thinking of United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, in which the European country goes into a new place and eradicates the indigenous population in whole or in part for the purpose of setting up their own system and repopulating it. Right, that is that is the distinction. So with settler colonialism, we have to pay attention to it is not an event. Colonization is not an event. It is a system. That means it's ongoing and it reproduces itself. So for us now, the settler state colonialism is still very much a real thing. Right? It looks a little bit different. A good number of us are still here. But it is a system that we live under and that you all live under as well. All right, we're in that together. So that this is not an us and them thing. <laughs> I, would, I would very much argue that Southern colonialism disfigures and harms all of us in those sort of ways, maybe some more than others. But I, I don't get, I'm not going to get into the, the, that sort of distinction right now. I think that's something we can share. So again, colonization is a system of power. 
um, that is realized through creating systems of dependency. Think about an economic system. If you can go get your own food, you are not dependent upon anyone else. When the food sources are eradicated and your land base is taken away, and you no longer have access to those same food sources. When the river systems and lake systems are dammed up and the sturgeon go away, and then you cannot grow wild rice anymore, you become dependent upon, let's say, I'm not sure, something like treaty annuities. And that becomes a system of dependency. Right? So how many of us can go get clean water? We're all pretty dependent upon systems of getting those things, you know, getting food. And when we have gardens, I like gardening on garden. It's a fraction of what we need, right? It's still lovely, it's beautiful, right? But it's a fraction of that sort of thing that we need. So we all share that level of dependency upon an economic and then political system to facilitate the economics of it. Colonization is also a system of thought. Right? It is its own way of thinking about and negotiating and relating to the world. Right? It has its own origin narratives. The establishment of the United States has its own origin narratives, 1776 and like, right? Capitalism has its own origin narratives. And these systems have a way in which to think about their origins and ways in which to reproduce themselves, that there is a system of thought here. And here is important to pay attention to a, a, a concept, something like hegemony, right? A system of power in such totality that it's almost impossible to think of anything outside of it. That is some of the challenges of colonialism. Right? And one of the things that comes with European colonialism is a presumption of universality. And here we think about religious studies and the development of the concept of world religions. Or the development of the concept of world religions, we can track as a late 18th century, late, late 1800s. Prior to that, it was thought of as other things, right? But the concept of world religions as an all encompassing system of thought to explain the world. So, as anthropologists are going out, as the concept of anthropology is just being as a buddy new system, right? As history is a buddy new system of thought right? as, as an academic discipline as people are going out into the world and saying well what's your idea of god how do you pray what's your idea of salvation right and imposing these ideas of religion as if it can be used to explain everybody now maybe that's useful in some ways right abraham tradition have some similarities when we get outside of that, though, can we make that presumption? Is that a good way of thinking about the world, or does that impose a certain system of thought upon the people that you are attempting to study and to know more about? I can argue that the discipline of anthropology, even though it is attempted to have a, a much greater communication of human knowledge has actually done much of the opposite. By imposing a singular system of thought, much of the thrust of anthropology throughout the 20th century has done much to limit our knowledge of other people. That's certainly true of American Indian people. Right now, while there are certain number small numbers of people within the discipline who have attempted to go against the grain, right, and there are some decent you know writers that are working to do that, the primary thrust still today in textbooks is a singular understanding of the world. Right, that is the presumption. And that that is what we have to work through and getting away from colonization. Right. So when we think about the notion of decolonization. It was weird to see yourself up on a screen, but <laughs> work outside of that. Simply put, decolonization is just the undoing of a colonial system, but as a system of thought, right? As a political and economic system, maybe eventually. 
But initially, we have to think that, think outside of that hegemony. So we have to grasp our own minds and fight for our own minds. It is the refusal, decolonization is a refusal of the totality of colonization to develop a different way of thinking and returning for indigenous people, a returning to our own ways of thinking and relating to the world. Decolonization seeks methods of thinking outside of the presumed system of universality that has been imposed. So how do we think outside of these systems? Right, that, that's a pretty significant question for all of us. So I, my work on worldview is an attempt to provide a, a conceptual method of thinking outside of that colonial universality, right? So we are using our own languages as a ways in which to think about how we construct the world differently. So worldview, um, don't worry, I'm not going to test you on this, but is an interrelated set of cultural logics that prescribe fundamental relationships to land, time, life, and provides a lens of understanding of those relationships. I'll say that one more time. It's an interrelated set of cultural logics, right? That prescribes fundamental relationships, the four main pieces, land, time, the rest of life, and provides a lens for understanding those relationships. So what is a worldview, what is it not? A worldview is an unconscious system of thought. It is deep. We don't think about worldview. It is mediated through language, it is mediated through narrative systems, origin narratives, and cultural systems. A worldview is communal. We're born into a worldview, all of us. Individuals, by this definition, do not have a worldview. We collectively, where we're born into and languages we speak, are born into a certain type. We can have a view of the world and can certainly think outside of that set of worldview. But it's still within us. It's still reproducing itself over and over again. That's just something we just have to grasp and then the coming works with. Right? It doesn't mean everything's lost. <laughs> But it does mean we have to think much deeper and intergenerationally about social change. Finally, a worldview is not an ideology. Ideology is when we're getting into intentional, conscious thought. Capitalism is an ideology. Christianity is an ideology. Right? Though their structure in my community is an ideology. Right. The claim system about social relationship is its own ideology. Right. Just, in this sense, ideology is not a pejorative term in the political sense. Now, it is always manipulative. And that manipulation can also take on positive roles. Like communities have tribal councils meeting to try to steer the community in a positive direction, that is also manipulative. Right. People thinking you know, differently and about how hard democracy is, is manipulative. You have a specific way you're trying to think about the world. That's fine, right? This is how you feel when I look at like Haudenosaunee communities. The origins of U.S. democracy is in Haudenosaunee confederacies. It's a very good information about that. A little in the weeds for us right now, but that's okay. All right. An indigenous worldview is an intimate relationship to a localized place. Place comes first. Time is related to in a cyclical manner. All right, this is the fun part now, especially in religious communities. What year is it? 2022. What does that mean? <laughs> Anyone? What is the point? So, say it again. A relationship to Christianity. So, a relationship to Christianity, right? Either birth or death of, death of Christ. But we all got to pay attention to that. Now. Try signing up online without saying it's 2022. 
or you know, to date myself a little bit, you know, try writing a check. I don't know if it's a check anymore, but like, I ain't even gonna cash that without the year, right? That is to say that time in your Western culture is primary. It is the narrative of people across time. Land does not have the same sort of agency or cogency within your Western communities. It has been disconnected from those particular relationships, save for property, right? These sort of power relationships about land. But that's, but that's not about land in the ways in which we're about land. We don't have boundaries. That's how you end up with Ho Chunk, Menominee, and uh, Potawatomi folks all living together. Closely associated villages. And that was the same thing all over the place. How do you get people going to Pipestone, Minnesota, to everybody getting Pipestone and safe travel? You're not going to fight your way to go to a ceremony, right? It's ridiculous. <laughs> you have protocols and ways in which to interact positively with one another. We were not fighting with one another, just in place. Everyone wants to make sure we understand that. <laughs> That was, that was very rare. And trade systems all up and down this area. Fighting just didn't happen that often. All right, so we talk about cyclical time. What are we talking about? Right. Talking about celestial events that we're paying attention to. Moon cycles, the thesis. Anyone see the full moon last night? Most of you guys did Hey, hey, yeah, but not quite Jesus. Before we coming out of what well, by the way, Jesus is a leaves turning moon right now. So now we're going to be not quite Jesus for us. Uh, the the, the um, leaves falling moon. Just general idea of what's happening in the world around us. I got a beautiful maple tree by my house. It's bright red right now. I love it. I'm not this maple tree. There, yeah, let's see if you can go. Sorry for those that are relying on the spoken word. I know you guys speak a little bit of my language. This is a very different system of thought, right? Is it embedded within our language system? Jesus, the sun, right? The daily cycle. Our relative, our brother, specifically, east to west, right, in a daily pattern. We have an annual solar cycle, in which we follow the star knowledge. Right? In there, there is no necessary form of counting. Because where we're located is primary. Your location in space is absolutely crucial to your being. You cannot exist outside of relationship to place. So our verb aya means to be, right? If I'm going to say aya, actually like in the Ojibwe dictionaries, it literally says aya to be in parentheses in a certain place. You have to name, if you're gonna say aya, you have to say exactly where you're at. So if you think differently, like Rene Descartes, I think, therefore, I am the cogito. It's fundamental. You're a Western philosophical premise. I think, therefore, I am. I can't say that in my language. It doesn't make any sense. It is a fundamental, different relationship to the world. And in this, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I mean, I have a personal feeling of that, but like, that's my advice. <laughs> But in and of itself, it is not better or worse. Like there's a different system of thought. Now, if you're interested in ecological relationships being sustained, if you're interested in some level of ethical parameters around our interaction with the environment, I would say we have a lot to offer as indigenous communities. The ways in which to think through those Right? Because built within our language systems, built within our worldview at a deep unconscious level, is an understanding of the world in which there are ethical restraints on our actions. There are ethical parameters 
and how it is that we are going to interact with one another and with our communities. Now, it's not always perfect, right? We have our own narratives about how we used to mess up too. Not some sort of utopian perfection. But it's really, really important to pay attention to how those different differences derive and how we might learn from it. Right? right? Your Western worldview, again, as a system of power that was exported to the rest of the world in the colonial period relates to land in the form of dominion. It is a system of power. I'm going to impose myself and we are going to take it over. If you don't like it, we'll just kill you. That still pops up now and we does that. Time is a linear progression of time in the Euro West. There is a counting system that organizes this. <clears throat> I always like to ask that. I suppose the fun part of students like teaching it out. So where are they going? Where are they coming to? Right. <clears throat> it reproduces itself. It, 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 based within there is a presumption that things are going to get better. Right? It is a progression. Those have flying cars by now, right? That's the comedic version. In this day and age, I can't believe that there is fill in blank. Built within that system of thought is the presumption that things are going to be better. I don't think the data demonstrates or backs that up. Maybe technology did. All the technology only works like, but it's only good when it works. <laughs> sure, I'm not alone. But when we think about systems of relating to one another, in the Euro West, social relationships are a hierarchy. And if we think about what's come out of medieval systems, pretty strict hierarchy, king, queen, dukes, so and so forth, I don't know the names. I stopped paying attention to that one a long time ago. But there is a hierarchy, right? Indigenous communities, there is a web of relatedness, right? So much so that the other than human communities, other than human people, the Manadu, my community aren't in an up down relationship, right? But we think about prayer, a very curious term. More often than not, in Christian and or associated communities, prayer is an up down schema. Right? You pray up. Don't want to pray down, don't want to go down. Up good, down bad. In indigenous communities, more often than not, our relatives that we're communicating with are lateral, they're around us. Our ancestors are here in this land. In that sense, an analysis of land is primary. Are we share this place with our ancestors? Our ancestors are not past tense. They're here with us and available through ceremony and narrative. We share with them these places. Here in Milwaukee and others. Right? That is an analysis of land. That is a land-based way of thinking about the world. What do you have access to? And we think about this lens of understanding balances of primary understanding in indigenous communities. That is part of this ethical restraint. There are logics of balance that guide all of us. We breathe air in, there is a logic of oxygen and carbon dioxide that balances itself <clears throat> at a chemical, microscopic, molecular level. That's how wind functions. At a deep logical level, there are systems of complex balance and ecological system. That if we participate well, not leaving them alone, we're part of the system. And that's another Euro Western fallacy that we're somehow separate from this thing. And we're part of this. If we interact well, 
within our ethical restraints, we can help promote those senses of flourishing. And flourishing is a primary negotiation of how Indigenous people interact with their environments. That's how you get the good land. You interact and help things promote and flourish in a good way. Like a beaver, it set up a dam and it kills off some trees and such, but it creates more life. Anyone follow the wolves in Yellowstone when they return them? Right? The entire park flourished more with the wolves there, and not just a couple of animals, the entire ecosystem. It fundamentally alters how rivers run through the land. When you don't have a unbalanced system where there's too many elk, right? That might even get the wolves along. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about the feedback. Don't always know where those are coming from. We belong. Dan, how am I doing that time? We could start, we could start going through some Q and A's. Right, let me. At a very deep level, indigenous community, indigenous languages are verb based. We know action. We understand and mediate in the world through action. Right. Your Western languages are noun based, right? They're good at describing things. Right. Yeah, but indigenous communities can do a very good job in helping to teach regarding what our interactions are and how we function in those space. And there's a number of uh, examples of that. Um, I will say one of the things that we do at like the Queen Institute uh, at the campus here, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, uh, is that we teach five indigenous languages. Potawatomi, Ojibwe, Oneida, Menominee, we are contract with Oneida, with Menominee through their university, and ho -Chunk. Right now, this semester we have four because we don't have any quote young people signed up, but we have those as options for people to learn. They also account for your uh, language requirements in the literature, uh, the trans sciences. That is an important distinction. There's a number of possibilities there. Um, but let us hear from you all. I hit you all with some. Some big concepts, worldview and such. That's here. I understand that in the indigenous indigenous languages, that there is no that we talk about the plants and animals. We we say it, and you do not say that. Yeah, I can't. I can't name you know, every single indigenous language, but the ones that I'm aware of, um, pronouns function very differently. Like we don't have gendered pronouns. Um, so the, the, like, you, I could talk about people in the room for 20, 30 minutes and gender usually wouldn't come up, which is not a thing, right? So like literally ween is a, a prefix that you could use, but it is never spoken about and it's always he or she. It just doesn't matter. There's also an understanding of continual of sexuality and gender within indigenous communities, but certainly within my community. Um, if we talk about relationships to the rest of life, absolutely. Yeah, we, there, there is not an it. Um, there is a, with the same pronouns and relational terms are used to speak of. So I will be hunting in a few weeks, the long case got. Uh, White-tailed deer is a close relative, and I would say Nisiang um, is an older brother. Um, and so when I you know my one of them, so bears my clan in those in that Dodem relationship. Um, there is uh, Ogama as a leader, 
right? So we, we use that would be a term, but we use family relationships to communicate there. So what we actually have in this large ethical system is a large extended family in which we live in, which includes all of life, right? So uh, the Jesus, the moon, uh, actually literally the night sun um, is um, no, Thomas, the grandmother. Sun, you know, as in sun in the sky, is older brother. Um, Earth is a little bit different. So we say Shkakamakwe or Mazakamakwe in Ojibwe uh, But there, it actually doesn't mean mother. It actually talks about the sustenance in there. So it, it's actually kind of, we wouldn't say Mother Earth. Um, we just say, you know, that kind of sustaining life force. I mean, it is clearly associated with the female. It's not etymologically in the word. It's just a slight distinction there. Whereas in Lakota, you say Uchimaka as uh, grandmother Earth is how they talk about Earth. So they do make a particular distinction. Is that no, but it says it helps a little. Yeah. Although the question is electrically institute. What are some of the things that are going on in the community that are accessible for everyone? So that's a good Can question. Repeat the question. Yeah, absolutely. So that is what is going on like the Quinny. Um, that, that is kind of community oriented, out, outward facing, that is available. Uh, so there are, there's actually three events that I can speak of um, upcoming that we're associated with. So Saturday the 15th, this upcoming, we are at Kawa. We'll be in front of Merrill Hall. That is an option. So one to five ish. Um, I think one or one thirty is the first grand entry. And there are all at UWM. That, these are all going to be at UWM, yeah. Um, Winona LaDuke will be speaking on Thursday, the 20th, I believe. I'm getting that one right. I can better pull up a, a calendar. So I know that Thursday is the 20th. Yes, and then Friday, the 21st, Ms. Joanna Goldman. Uh, she is a Seneca uh, professor from the University of Buffalo. will be speaking uh, on campus at 5 p.m. Uh, and those, if you go to like the Queenie website, we do have those up on our calendar page. Um, so there's a couple of items there up and coming quickly. Could you share the story Excuse about the first circle? Sure. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Please repeat the question so that it goes into yeah. the captions. No, they, no. So yeah, there's a question about the fire circle that we have at the Quinny. So we do have in front of Merrill Hall uh, with a generous gift from Bader Philanthropies. Um, we have a, a host of grandfather rocks, and rocks are um, show us their grandfathers, um, is how we think about them. Um, and to your point, Bernice, you know, about how we relate to the rest of the world. Um, so on Fridays, more often than not, we do have fires um, that we are able to communicate. Um, this is kind of a brief ceremonial component that we have on campus. Uh, and then we also have that as available to other folks, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who can want to be participating with um, fire if they have you know, some sort of memorial that they're participating with that they, that they go with. Um, so there is those possibilities on campus. The question over here. Sure, go ahead. What are three steps we can take actively today to <laughs> stop decolonialization? <laughs> that, is, that is a very pragmatic. Uh, what are three steps we can take to stop decolonial thinking? Right, absolutely. Um, one is learning an in indigenous language. Um, there are plenty of opportunities here. We're very lucky to have Margaret Noden, uh, who's been here for 19 years, and her partner. Um, uh, Mike Zimmerman, who teaches Potawatomi at our school now, um, that we have plenty of really good opportunities who are on the cutting edge of teaching indigenous languages. Um, take in another course uh, with some of us, if not all folks here. Uh, there, are, there are a number of really good opportunities that we have as we're rebuilding indigenous faculty. Uh, we're teaching some creative and very engaging materials. Um, I would also say that go build a relationship with a piece of land. Go, go exercise that possibility. And that can be a lot of different things. That's going to be a lot of things you for people, but go somewhere and make it beautiful. 
you know, if I can just be straight up, right? Um, but go, go somewhere and help make that thing beautiful. Um, as time the orange states in um, they're there, um, the land is either everywhere or it's nowhere, mm. right? So like the urban places are also very beautiful places in land. <laughs> like it never stops being that land and our relationship to that is a state of mind, right? So if we participated in that. Go. Elizabeth and then Bruce. Yeah. I'm gonna thank you for emphasizing the relationship to the land that the indigenous people have. Mm -hmm. And um, this is really not a question. It's something that struck me thinking about it with the native peoples who lived here were forced to migrate. I never thought about the, the green of the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so kind of a, real, come to realize the grief associated with having to move in landscapes. And there's a, particularly like there's a number of Cherokee authors who have written about that um, and, and what that has meant. You know, some of us have moved, some of us have not, but there's certainly those relationships have certainly been altered for all of us. Um, and those are really. I mean, my family was forced because of economic dependency to participate in the deforestation process in northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. I just think about that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and maybe like some of y'all family, you know, like my great grandmother was, was paid, they were paid script, like they wouldn't pay real money during the Depression. Mm -hmm. Right. Set up a, a, a company place, set up a company town. You need to go with rent, you they printed their own money and then extract all those resources to help colonization, right? And based on the colonization is political and economic exploitation. It hasn't stopped, it just looks different now. But that grief is definitely a real, real thing. And we're also, you know, added on top of that, the grief of dealing with intergenerational trauma, not only of the land, but also boarding schools and having your children stolen. Right. Like that, that's, that's not stop. I'm terrified every fall sending my kids to school. I can send them to any community school here, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a different thing. Terrifying. Mm -hmm. My regular mother was taken at eight. That was a little bit different conversation. I think that would deserve its own negotiation. But like, you ever wonder why Indian people don't trust anyone? <laughs> that sort of abject brutality. How do you view or what is the meaning to you of the land acknowledgements that uh, are becoming more prevalent in the last few years? Um, that's a good question. You know, what my, what's my feeling of land acknowledgements and the, the prevalence? Um, I think that they could be a good, useful first step, um, but they are a stepping stone, not a place to end up. I would encourage you, if you're going to negotiate one yourselves, to, to have it end with something like, and this is what it compels me to do, and have a group or you know, a committee that keeps pushing the envelope about what you're doing about it. It's not enough to sustain it. I mean, that's one of the discursive issues, you know, in your Western culture. Like, there's a, there's a discursive ontology that you can just say something and then beat it. Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, you better put your behind and match it. I may be real about that. I guess I lost my professorial ability right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm also an activist, right? So yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, that's, that's the answer. Right. So you mentioned they're there. Yeah. We just finished uh, watching the second season of Reservation Dogs, which got us super excited. Uh, who who is out there who are, are writing in kind of fiction? Uh, realms or from an indigenous perspective that get you really excited these days that are not amplified enough right now? Uh, that's a good question. What, so, you know, who's writing in fiction that's maybe I'm getting excited about? Um, or not fiction, like, like, right, right. 
Um, I, I'm I've always taken though the living surgery has always um, you know been you know a big way in the communities. Um, I'm always taken with her material um, because it is so engaging, and I think particularly her labor work has done such a great job of kind of taking on some pretty difficult tasks. I mean, in the roundhouse to take on the role of um, Missing murder of indigenous women and sexual assault in indigenous communities through the eyes of 13 year old boys is that very, very courageous and, and very, very useful in, in a lot of different ways. Um, Who is that again? Lu Louise Erdrich. Uh, so she's uh, Ojibwe from uh, Turtle Mountain, uh, Liz works in Twin Cities. Um, but she, I mean, she's been a you know, big way for a long time. Um, I, I'm really looking for something different right now. Um, what gets me excited is critiques of indigenous people by indigenous people, if I'm to be brutally honest, um, because while there's been a lot of really good work, um, I think that there, we, we also have to be critical and go in the next step within ourselves. I'm, I'm very interested in um, creative articulations of the damn structure. And there's not much out there. I mean, it's little bits and pieces because of the ways in which that as a political system, socio-political system um, was intentionally eradicated and disempowered in the 1800s for the purpose of colonial control um, is something that I think that we should really pay attention to as we regenerate different ways of thinking about and interacting with the world. Most of my work and energy is really about learning my own language and following what that work is going to be. I also am very interested in um, uh, the concept of rematriation, um, in which there's a few people, Eve Tuck has written about um, curriculum, rematriating curriculum, um, Gucci Cook, Sakusatsuni uh, Mohawk is a midwife, and it's written in kind of, I don't, I don't know if I can actually say coin phrase rematriation in the 70s. Um, but thought about the, the re-empowerment of women in leadership roles, which is sorely lacking in most of our communities, indigenous and non-indigenous, I would add. Um, I'm very interested in what that can do to uh, return some balance in our own interaction with one another. Um, and I think those are really important um, fascinations. I am you know, a little bit biased. My, my spouse, Dr. Sherry Bassett, is also writing about repatriation, which is part of my fascination. She writes about women in uh, playing lacrosse in Haudenosaunee communities uh, and the ways in which young women and girls have been at the forefront of creative and um, powerful articulations of indigenous identity and nationhood in really powerful ways. And that there is some important returning um, to women in leadership roles. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's something that gets me really excited. So I'm just, I'll just tell a story, right? I'm just gonna go that route. Um, so, um, Louise Hearn is Mama Bear, uh, so she's a fair mother in Akwesasne, um, and they're, um, they're, you know, just like all of them are dealing with patriarchy and uh, abuse in certain ways, right, and it's really, really challenging to work through and think through some of those uh, phenomena, particularly in an indigenous community, so they, they put out a, um, there's a, you can watch this video, it's called Rematuration Magazine, Michelle Shannon, Doe is Oneida, 
and out of New York, and she's put this out, and they have the, uh, you know, Me Too, are we ready for Me Too in indigenous communities? And the young woman, Chelsea Sunday, who's also locked this out, if I remember correctly, um, you know, talked about, like, these are our uncles and our grandparents and um, fathers in some situations. Like, what does this mean to, to function as a community? So um, what women in um, Model Bear's Lodge did um, is they put on a feast and celebrated the seven or 10 men in the community that who they felt were living up to their obligations and showing good leadership as men in their community, which is one of the most brilliant things I've heard in quite some time. Because while they did that, it simultaneously indicated who was not. In a really powerful communal way. And I think that is the sort of engagement, um, creative, indigenous, loving, returning that is really important that we need right now. Um, in that ceremony, they laid it at the hands of the men. It's like, this is your turn to take this now. Okay, we're, we're, we're done. It's your turn to hold each other accountable to a higher standard. And if we're going to live in community, there has to be accountability. So that's what, in a very roundabout way, <laughs> um, I some of the stuff on TV, obviously television stuff, I find kind of wanting um, for, for a number of reasons, mostly because I'm kind of a nerd, and you know they they get stuff wrong, and I take it personal, and I wish I knew that, but like, what am I going to do? Um, so those are some things, but thank you for the questions. Could you talk to you, one of the things you, you mentioned that excites you is learning more of uh, uh, your language. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the cycle between uh, worldview and language and how you, you find it yourself as your worldview changes, it informs the way you have a language and vice versa as your language improves, does it affect your worldview? Um yes and no. Um repeat the question. Please. Certainly, thank you for the reminder. Um does essentially you're asking how how the worldview and language and my learning of language help to shape and understand worldview. Um Worldview changes intergenerationally and over long periods of time. So I wouldn't say that it actually changes my worldview. It certainly changes my ability to live into a better way, right? Um, but if we think about the structure of, I mean, in my case, so Jim um, we we don't, thought is structured very differently. If we're building thought and sentence structure within a Jewish moment, you start in the center with a verb and you build out from the, that center, right? Um, uh, things like the weather are verbs, a one, it is foggy, right? It's, it's, that, it's, not, it's not a good translation, right? It is foggy, right? The, the atmospheric condition of fog is emanating itself right now. Bishwa, uh, the color red, um, is a verb. It is emanating the color of red, that thing that you're talking about. It is the, the light and the understanding of, the quantus, understanding of quantum physics, essentially, that there is energy that's coming towards your eye that is this color. It is making the world in your understanding red. Um, <clears throat> we 
you know, when you add yourself and other people's actions into it, they, they come in prefixes and suffixes, right? And I'm, I'm literally just learning that right now and, and how to do that is like crazy complicated and very frustrating. It's kind of double part of your own language, but like, <laughs> um, that's, that will get over myself at some point. To, to think about the centrality of action is a very different way of negotiating the world. It's one thing to identify what's going on. And again, your Western languages do a pretty good job of that. But what to do about it is embedded in indigenous languages at a much deeper level that many things are thought of as acting, interacting, in action and motion. Um, and it's just understood that that's how you function in the world. And the other piece, too, that I think is just important, just this the role of relationships, of living in a very large extended family, and what that truly means, if we're going to take that seriously. And I know, you know, it, it's one thing to be like, oh, you know, my brother, my sister, you know, but like, to mean that, <laughs> what does that mean to put it in action? Um, because there is a range, I think, of uh, what that negotiation means. Is it just discursive or is it deeper than that? So I, I think that those are kind of my general understandings. You know, we have a concept called Chittabedjigit. I wrote about my book a little bit. Um, and and the, the best kind of definition would be that which makes all things belong. And interesting enough, anthropologists kind of missed over this term because they kept trying to impose this idea of a great spirit, right? Gichi Manadu, right? Which I actually argue is in a colonial missionary position in the Inoval. You can use that term in our language, and people do in, in our own indigenous communities. Like, um, I don't think that there's much reason to use it. The idea of a high God is, that I would argue, an imposed like, notion. And, um, that's debatable that everyone agrees with me on that, just to be as clear as possible. Um, but if you think about it at a deep level, like Chitta Benjiga, that there is this energy that makes all things belong, right? That there's a logic embedded in our system of thought that we have to follow. Right? We can be real serious about belonging. Like we have to be pretty radical in those notions about belonging. Um, you know, Chitta Benjiga is not an entity, it's not anthropomorphized. Um, it's pretty rarely thought about or given. Uh, and pretty often indigenous notions of relationship to the unseen or the Manadu, or that was often called spirit, even though spirits were a bad translation, um, because it is incorporeal, right? Spirit by definition is not material, not spatial. So it doesn't make sense in my language, right? So I'll just say Manadu. <laughs> It's up to you to figure out what minor is and try to experience that. I just I can't do that for you. Um, that, that, that at a deep level, we have you know a, a different orientation, a different mooring system that orients us to the world um, that is pretty powerful. But it takes a lot of intentionality to do it because we have these other cellular quantum systems around us now that force us to do other things. Um, but it's still there and important to pay attention to. And that's why I went in the route of uh, kind of professor to profess, which I don't think is that much different than uh, preaching <coughs> in some instances. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> Other people might not be dying. Yeah. Super pleased to stop the episode. Thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, as you can see, the Wisconsin Department of Construction has very fine business information as well. And two summer students courses about the year. Thank you very much. Up here.
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.